We are back on the Kelvin Duke Show of Science on the CBC. And we're live. Okay. Again, my internet fans are going to go, who the heck? Well. <laughs> Ready? Um, so, we started out looking at the eight types of biomes, and the new word that I gave you last day that we're going to write again, each biome contains many types of ecosystems. Jess, what we're going to be doing today is, if you ever played with something like Google Maps or Google Earth, where you start looking at the whole planet and you slowly zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, Curtis, that's our goal. We're going to start, looking, start out with biosphere, all life. We're looking at biomes, big divisions of different types of similar land, fault, land types, and we're going to zoom in from there to ecosystems. Thank you, sir. Uh, ecosystems are on a smaller scale. Then biomes, we're zooming in. And this concept is a lot easier now that all of you have seen Google Maps or Google Earth and understand the concept of zooming in. Um, there is no size limit. We said it can be as small as a tidal pool, a tide pool, where there's a hole in a beach. The tide flows over it at high tide. When the tide recedes, it's dry all around, but some seawater stays in there, and it stays in there long enough for the tide to come back and refill it. That can be a, a little ecosystem right there called a tide pool, or a rotting log can be its own ecosystem, or it can be as large as a mountain range. really depends on what parts of the ecosystem you're choosing, Hannah, to focus on as being things that it has in common. If you're focusing on geology, you might focus on the entire mountain range, like the coastal mountains, because they're all forced, uh, created by uh, plate tectonics. If you're focusing on a specific type of uh, bug or insect, it might be a log or, or a stream or something like that. How do we define an ecosystem? Well, it's made up of two main things. It's made up of all of the biotic components, and that's a word you need to know. The biotic components, Curtis, those are the living components. Everything from the small microfunguses and mosses and bugs and insects all the way up to blue whales and elephants. Uh, plants, animals, microorganisms. And the, what was the opposite of biotic? We've used the word, and you need to know it, so we'll use it again here. Abiotic, Abiotic that means the non-living components. The two big ones, temperature and precipitation, but oxygen, water, nutrients, light, soil, all those. And the, 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 they interact, interact with each other more or less directly. So if we're talking about an ecosystem, Nicole, we're really looking at how these two main subgroupings interact. If they have no interaction whatsoever, we might start to suggest that those are two separate ecosystems. Rarely will you have no interaction whatsoever, but okay. I showed you a video last day, what is an ecosystem? I'm not going to reshow it. Instead, we're going to move on. Within ecosystems, you have what we call habitats. That's a place in which an organism, a life form, lives. So we go from biosphere, planet, biomes, smaller, ecosystems within biomes, and there you have within ecosystems, uh, habitats. Some abiotic interactions in ecosystems. Well, some of the things that we would look at is uh, to see if an ecosystem has the same nutrients. These are the chemicals that are required for plant and animal growth. Two of the big ones, nitrogen, usually it's actually N3 in the soil, it's a tri-bonded covalent thingy, and phosphorus, and phosphorus on the periodic table I think is just P, right, I think. In the 1880s, they had calculated how much nitrogen there was in the soil. Plants, all plants need nitrogen to grow. In fact, we don't call it nitrogen. Nowadays, we call it fertilizer. 
and they had calculated how much nitrogen there was available to grow, and they had done the math, it was a fairly simple equation, and they had realized that the most number of people the earth could hold, could feed, because it all comes from vegetables, was 1.5 billion. That was it. What's our population of our planet now? A little more than that. A little more than that? How much more? Okay. In, in the late 1880s, 1890s, and 1900s, a German chemist found out how to pull nitrogen from the air, because it's everywhere in the air, compress it, and turn it into fertilizer, and get it into soil. However, that doing that compressing the nitrogen into a molecule called ammonia or ammonium, that chemical bond requires a great deal of energy. And the result of that is that's why those fertilizer bombs that you may have occasionally heard of or heard about um, are so devastating. There was that fertilizer plant that exploded in Texas a couple of weeks ago. Um, the uh, before your time, but you may have heard of the Oklahoma City bombing. That was a fertilizer bomb because that, that's a lot of stored chemical energy. It's estimated that about 80% of the nitrogen in your bodies right now was pulled from the air after the 1880s. It led to a population explosion. It's been argued that this German scientist, I believe his last name was Huber, uh, may have saved more lives than anyone else in history. Billions of people. He was a real creep though. A, a, a real, you know what, he was an evil person because he also invented mustard gas and was big into gassing. He was part of the German forces gassing other troops. One of the big debates in history is, was this guy a good person or a bad person? Uh, if I have time on Friday, I may play a little podcast for you which tells his story. It's both interesting and creepy at the same time. Hey, what else? Uh, another thing we look at is the amount of photosynthesis. What is photosynthesis? You learn about this in science? I think eight or nine, I can't remember. It, it, it's the secret to life on this planet. Almost all life, and I can't say all life, there are these uh, things called extremophiles that live in very bizarre environments where there is no sunlight. Remove those and it's still nearly 100%. So 100% of the life that we uh, on the earth gets its energy from the sun, from plants that convert uh, what do I want to call this? Solar energy. That's the word I was looking for. I was thinking sunlight. Into chemical energy. And then we eat either the vegetables or the plants, or we eat the animals that eat the plants that got their energy. But it, it's, that's the great circle of life, Simba, the great circle of life. Then we die, our molecules all split up. Oh, by the way, all the molecules in your body, you don't have a single original molecule. They were all here when the earth formed. And what that means is because these molecules, as they decay and as a person rots in the ground, sorry, but that's what happens, and as they decay and those molecules get spread throughout the ecosystem and they circulate their way through the earth, after about 50 years, it's almost guaranteed, if a person has been dead for more than 50 years or so, you probably have at least one of their molecules, their atoms, their elements, somewhere in you. So almost all of you have, for example, a molecule from Einstein or Beethoven or Christ or anybody, because the molecules, they don't vanish. When you die, your molecules will go back into the system. The molecules all originally came from a supernova somewhere in outer space. And 100, 200 years from now, a kid will be sitting in a classroom, learning hopefully better science than this, because technology will have gone a long way. But part of you will be learning along with them. That's both creepy and cool at the same time. Uh, the amount of photosynthesis depends on how much sunlight the ecosystem re receives. And I think I said last day, yeah, you can notice it if you go hiking, if you see a hill that faces to the north, that means it gets shade an awful lot. You'll see different vegetation than if you see a hill that faces to the south. What country, you with me, Emily? Of course you are. What country is famous for its wines? Actually, more famous than Italy. You said, someone said it. Yeah, France. Oh, by the way, Okanagan as well. But the reason France was so famous is they have in one section a whole bunch of south-facing slopes. And those south-facing slopes get more sunlight 
than any other areas in that area, and that's what gives them their unique flavor. Okanagan, uh, when you think of the Okanagan, Emily, do you think sunny weather or crappy weather? It's not a coincidence that it, we think of it as sunny weather. California, winemaking industry, sunny weather. Lower mainland, not really that, they're trying to make some wines in the lower mainland, not really a big winemaking area, why? Crappy weather, rainy weather. So the amount of photosynthesis depends on how much sunlight an ecosystem receives. Entire industries are built, built around that. Soil. And again, this is something you can notice if you go on a hike. You may come to areas where not, not much is growing. Bad soil right there for a couple of hundred yards. And then you walk a little further and lots of stuff is growing. Good nutrients in that soil there. As part of your homework, you can get to today or tomorrow, page 38. Some of you already handed it in. Turn the page. This is where we left off. So those are the abiotic interactions in ecosystems, some of the main ones, soil, nutrients, sunlight. What are some of the biotic, some of the living interactions in ecosystems? We're going to break these up from bigger to more specific. First of all, we refer to animals or living creatures by species. By species. What's a species? That's a group of closely related organisms that can reproduce with each other. Now, that's not quite right. There are some species that can reproduce with members of different species. For example, horse and a donkey. When they have a baby, we call it a mule. And a horse is a different species from a donkey. But for the most part, different species can't reproduce with each other. So, hey, name a species, Canada geese. There's a good example. Name another species, bald eagles. I don't know why I'm on a bird kick, but there's another good example. Bald eagles live all over North America. Now let's go focus in a bit more. Population. That would be all the members of a particular species within an ecosystem. So bald eagles live over, all over North America, but up near Squamish, there's a population of bald eagles. Squamish is famous for its bald eagles along the river there. They've got a big population of them there. Okay? So you see the zoom, we're zooming in a little bit. Oh, but in that population of bald eagles, there aren't just bald eagles, there are other life forms, other biotic species that live in that area, and we call that a community. We use some of these same words, by the way, to describe towns. Not the first word, we don't, re we don't refer to a town as a species, but we refer to towns as populations and communities. Okay? A community is all the populations of a different species that interact. In fact, I gave you this lovely picture here. here is, before you turn the page, we're going to write some stuff on this diagram. Here is the zooming in. So we go from the biosphere, all life on Earth, We zoom into an ecosystem, could be as small as a rotting log, as big as a mountain range, but it's where a bunch of different species and abiotic features have stuff in common, interact with each other. Community, more than one species, all in the same ecosystem. Population, one species, all the uh, red-eared painted turtles in one area. And this chart, I liked it, except it's using a different word. It used the word individual at the bottom. We're actually going to use the word organism, life form. But think single, indi the reason uh, individual, uh, it's tough to think of little bacteria as individuals, so we'll call them organism life forms, but one single thing. Biggest to smallest. Yeah, now you can turn the page. 
So here's our hierarchy. I had it on the chart on the previous page. If we go from smallest to largest, we go from organism, one squirrel, Charlie the chipmunk, Charlie the squirrel. Population, all the squirrels in an area, in a small, in a forest. If we look at all of the creatures in the forest, we call that the community. And if we also include the non-living features that interact with this community, we call that an ecosystem. I had a tough time really defining these, so I'm kind of repeating myself. I wasn't joking at the beginning when I said I was going to be repeating myself. I'm hoping this makes it kind of you're wrapping your brain around it. A little tricky to define. Now, if an ecosystem is healthy, if it's sustainable, if it can continue moving on, then every single part of the ecosystem has its own, what we call, niche or niche, depending on how you want to pronounce it. That's the way in which an organism contributes to and fits into its environment. As an example, two of the big ways are predators and prey. We'll look at that a bit later. Okay? It's all of the physical, chemical, and biological interactions for a species to survive and reproduce. Hey, one of the basics, Emily, if there's not enough food, the species will die. There, that's why when we destroy land or when we change an ecosystem, there's often unforeseen consequences. What we've done, we haven't hurt the organism. We've hurt the niche that they had carved out for themselves over centuries or millennia or millions of years of evolution and the earth getting the balance just right. And we come along and we wreck it. Not always on purpose, but we're pretty good at wrecking it. Um, how can individuals, organisms or species, in an e ecosystem interact with each other? So how can squirrels interact with other squirrels? Or how can squirrels interact with, hey, what's another animal in a forest? Chipmunk. Chipmunks, those are very similar, though. Uh, you know, how can squirrels interact with... Uh, a deer. I don't think we have mongoose. Mongo I don't know whether it's mongoose, mongoose, or mongooses, but I don't know if we have the plural of one single mongoose in boreal Canadian forests. Deer, bobcats, predators, prey. How, how can they Grizzly. interact with each other? There's a fancy word. And the fancy word is, yes, someone said it because they're looking at my notes from last day, or did they actually know that word? Symbiosis. Think balance. If a system is healthy, Darian, then the symbiosis is nice and it's in balance. And generally, left alone, systems will cycle between population maximum and minimum, but they will find a balance to cycle between. And again, generally, we're pretty good at wrecking that. And again, not always intentionally. So that refers to the interaction between members of two different species that live together in close association. It has to be close association. Amber, our squirrels in our backyard don't care how they get along with elephants in the Sub-Sahara. There's no, there's no overlap there, at least not as far as I know. And you know what? Our squirrels living in our backyard don't care about how they uh, interact with uh, wild lynx in Ontario. Even though if they were in the same area, they probably would interact with each other. They don't care. So close association, different species, how they interact, we give that a name. We call that symbiosis. And there are three types. Uh, you need to know these words. You need to memorize these. I'm going to define them in a second. But if you're someone who likes to like muck up your notes, you can put little stars next to your words to know, and also the word symbiosis. The first type is what we call Commensalism. Commensalism. And I have known that word for about a week longer than you guys have. 
The second type is called mutualism. That one I had heard of, even though I didn't know the definition. The third type I had heard of, because I find them interestingly fascinating, parasitism. Those are the three main ways that two different species can interact with each other if they're living in the same area. They can commensurate, they can have mutual or mutualism interactions, or they can be parasites. Let's define them. Next page. Uh, commensalism happens more often than you think, Amy, it's where one species benefits while the other is neither helped nor harmed. And a good example is the barnacles on a whale. Barnacles are small little shell-like sea creatures. They grow, if you ever go to a dock by an ocean, you'll see the pilings are covered with barnacles. But they grow on whales. They don't hurt the whale. But they get a benefit from that because the whale moves them through the ocean, which means, because they don't swim very fast themselves, as the whale swims, ocean water is flowing over them, pulling in and bringing in nutrients. So they get a benefit out of it. But the whale, meh, couldn't care less. Not hurt, not helped. I tried to think of another one. I haven't yet. If you come up with a good example of commensalism, let me know. There's some in the textbook, I think, and I think they'll walk you through some in the homework. Okay. Yep. Like the little uh, birds on the hippos. Like ah, but the hippos get a benefit from it because they kill. In fact, you're going to get to the next one. Mutual. You, you've just. What a great segue, Hayden, my friend. Mutualism. By the way, the word mutual means like together, right? Mutualism is a relationship in which. Both organisms benefit. And a great example is the birds you see on the backs of animals in Africa. The birds get protected from, by the big hippo or rhino. Probably a little cat's not going to come near them. And they eat the bugs that are itching or plaguing the rhino that the rhino can't get to. Happy and happy. Uh, the org except we would say, you know what, now maybe I have to take that back because really, if we're going to be fussy, it has to be a situation where the organisms wouldn't survive without each other. I'm not sure whether the birds would survive without those rhinos or not. They might, they might not. I'd have to double check that. Uh, but a good one, hey, flowers rely on birds and bees to pollinate them, and the bees rely, and the birds rely on the nectar of the flowers to eat. You can't have one without the other. Uh, there are some strange ones. Lichen, which is found on lots of trees in BC. If you're ever walking in a forest and you see that almost light green, silvery, it's not a moss, it's almost like a, it's a very, very faint kind of, it's got loops on it, that's lichen. And it's a combination of algae and moss. They join together to form one brand new organism and they feed each other. The moss breaks up the wood. The algae takes that wood and turns it into food eating some of it, but also leaving some of it for the moss. Uh, there's some other cool examples on page 41. If you have your textbook handy, open it to page 41. We'll just look at a few. If you don't have your textbook handy, try Then we get to my creepy favorites, parasites. I will, this weekend, send you a podcast on parasites. You don't have to listen to it. I'm telling you, it's got some of the coolest stories about parasites, and it'll creep you out. Because, well, we get parasites, too. So, what's a parasite? One species benefits while the other is harmed. Usually, parasites are smaller and more numerous than the hosts. Bacteria, worms, all sorts of parasites. Uh, a, a famous parasite right now is the guinea worm, which is a disgusting worm in Africa. Jimmy Carter, who was president of the U.S. from 1976 to 1980, he's in his 80s now, he's quite elderly, but he has made it his life mission to actually make the guinea worm extinct. It's a huge problem in Africa. It's a, if, you, if you read about it, it's quite disgusting. It's a worm about Yalong. Yeah, yeah. 
When you're in the water, it crawls in through cuts in your feet. It lays eggs in you. And then a couple of months later, when you're in the water, over a period of days, incredibly painfully, to the point where you're screaming in pain, it slowly crawls its way out of you, enters the water system again, and waits for the next person. So they've almost completely eradicated it. There used to be thousands and thousands of cases each year. I think last I heard, they had 40 cases last year. If they can make it extinct, well, th th once it dies off, it's never going to be a problem again. Because if it can't find its hosts to reproduce, then the current population will die. If they can't lay their eggs, gone. We have eliminated one virus, smallpox. It's one of the biggest accomplishments of the past century. We made smallpox extinct. Smallpox had killed millions of people. Oh, that we have a couple in vials, but we, but it's extinct. It's no longer out there. Uh, Bill Gates. Who's Bill Gates? Computers. Computers. Which one? Which company? Okay, he has almost made polio extinct. They're down to, I think, 40 cases left in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and they're hoping within the next three years it will become the second ever virus that, again, once we get rid of it, if it, if it can no longer migrate to human hosts, it'll die off. So if that happens, it will, it's caught, I think he, it's taken $5 billion to do it, but it, it kills it, it's, it, polio is a terrible disease. What it does is it affects children, and it usually paralyzes them when they're five or six for the rest of their life. So terrible, terrible disease. What's yep. Virus? Smallpox. Oh. Uh, do you ever go to TED.com? Any of you go to TED Talks, TED.com? If you have any science nerd, go. They've they got great talks. There's a great talk. It's very graphic. You're going to see pictures of people with sores all over their body dying, because that's what smallpox was. But it's a talk by the doctor who was present at the last person who died from smallpox. He said it was both depressing and a privilege, because once that person died, I knew we'd got it. We'd, we'd managed to actually eliminate a virus from the earth. It happened in 1978, I think, 72, somewhere in there. Remarkable. How many of you have grandparents or great-grandparents? If you see them without shirt sleeves, you see a big round scar right there. So you guys are too young. You might, so my parents do, because they were born in Paraguay in South America. That was the smallpox vaccination. It was this huge, huge needle that every kid got when they were younger, it left a permanent scar. It was very painful, but it was the price to pay to get rid of a virus that killed millions of people. So parasites. Um, a good parasite doesn't kill its host. So a good parasite usually is not, a host is not killed, but weakened. Why would a parasite not want to kill a host? Well, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, there are over 3,000 that affect us. It's more common than you think. Uh, hey, you want an example that we've been dealing with here in BC? BC? The pine beetles have wiped out about one-third of our forests in the northern interior. Okay? Um, there's something called brood parasitism. Birds do this. This is where one species of bird lays its eggs in another species of bird's nest. Cuckoo birds do this. And they're very clever. Their egg usually hatches about a day before the natural eggs. And so it's got a day longer to eat food, which means it's going to be the biggest and the baddest in the nest. And many, many studies have shown that the bird that chirps the loudest gets the most food from the mama bird. So once you're already the biggest, you're chirping the loudest, you're getting the most food, you're constantly going to be bigger and badder. And usually the other birds starve. Die. So cuckoo birds and your cuckoo clock, they're very nice. They're a creepy bird out in the wild. Turn the page. Pictures. It says, which picture illustrates mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism? How about let's use a capital M for mutualism, a capital C, and a capital P. That top one. Miller? Why? They're both benefiting. Okay. And there are lots of situations in the wild where both species benefit. What do you think the bottom right, this creepy one here is? Parasitism. One is benefiting and the other one's not getting food, so being weakened. 
commensalism, uh, one person did the cooking, but they both ate. Okay. Competition. Well, species are in competition with each other because they want to survive, and especially if they are not mutual, if there's not mutualism, competition is the harmful interaction between two species, between two or more organisms. I keep saying species. I really should say organisms because this can be on the bacteria level as well. Uh, it can occur when two organisms have to compete for the same resource in the same area at the same time. So competition can limit the size of a population. Hey, if there's only so much food to go around, there's only so many animals that we can uh, support. So how do we deal with that? Well, one type of competition, we break them up into categories. The first category is predation. Predator is the root word. And that's a relationship where one organism, which we call the, spell it right, Mr. Duick, Predator eats some or all of another organ, organism, life form. Uh, we have predators. What's the opposite of a predator? Prey. prey. Spelled with an E, by the way. With an A, that's prey. With an E, that's prey. And this has driven a lot of the adaptations that life forms have evolved over the past, well, over millions of years. Think about animals that you know are predators. First, let's eliminate birds. Think about mammals that you know are predators, and I'm willing to bet you're going to notice they have certain features in common. Teeth, yes. Claws, yes. Okay. They have evolved, they have adapted, because that makes them better predators. Think about prey, mammals that are prey, and you may notice that they have certain features in common. Thin, long legs and big lungs. Right? They're good at running, for the most part. So predatory animals have adaptations that make them good predators. And prey animals have adaptations that keep them from being eaten. And some of them have the same adaptations. As an example, uh, the ability to hide in the background is useful for both prey animals, think a tiger with its stripes in grass, or think lions with their, or cheetahs in grass are very hard to spot. And deer also blend in very well. Antelope also blend in very well with the background. How does that explain zebras, Mr. Duick? Actually, the theory is because they're herd animals that if they're all clumped together, those vertical stripes make it difficult for a predator to pick out an individual animal. Okay. So uh, nature stumbles onto the same solutions for different species sometimes. We can model this great circle of life with what we call predator-prey graphs. So here is a predator-prey graph. This is snowshoe rabbit and Canada lynx. This was the best one that I could find that was black and white that I could photocopy. There's beautiful color ones online, but I needed to get black and white one. So the hollow circles are the snowshoe rabbit, and the colored black circles are a Canada lynx. I need to make sure. Do you guys know what a lynx is? Yes. What's a lynx? Yeah, think like a, a midget a mountain lion, small mountain lion. Bobcat is also another name for it. Okay, so you know what one is. Um, snowshoe rabbit, I mean, you know what a rabbit is. This is going from before the 1850s to about the 1930s. Which species is the predator? Lynx, okay, we know that. I was worried I'd have to explain that to you. Which species is the prey? The rabbit. Take a look at this graph. So the higher the graph, the bigger the population. What do you notice? Do you notice? I think that's what I asked, yeah? What do you notice happens shortly after the rabbit population peaks? So let's look uh, right here. 
let's point with my eraser. Right here. Here's a rabbit population peak. Uh, what happens to the link population shortly thereafter? Sorry? Shortly thereafter. Why does it peak shortly thereafter? Why would the lynx population go up just after the rabbit population goes up? More food. Okay. Uh, what do you notice happens shortly after the lynx population peaks? And they started going back down already a little bit before that because there wasn't enough food for them to go around to go around for them. Oh, but then when those lynx got on site, not only is there not enough food, uh more prey. And you'll notice that over and over. Rabbit population peaks. Uh, this is, now, this one doesn't fit the pattern. You know what? I'm willing to bet there was some kind of winter catastrophe. Emily, you're with me, of course. Uh, I'm willing to bet that there was some kind of winter catastrophe or something bad going on there. But certainly here, rabbit population peaks, lynx population peaks. In fact, you could almost make a rough guess as to how many rabbits each lynx eats if you really looked at the numbers closely on average. You can get a lot of information from a predator-prey graph, and they almost all look like that. They have peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, and generally the prey echoes the peaks and valleys, not as high, maybe not as low, and shortly after. So what do you notice hope happens shortly after the rabbit population peaks? Lynx population increases. More food. You know what? Instead of food, more prey. After the lynx population peaks, rabbit population decreases. More predator. And that's healthy. We don't want a population to be a straight line. What we do want is a population that cycles up and down between two extremes. That's OK. But it should cycle between two extremes. It's when the population suddenly goes out of those extremes, usually because we screwed something up, that's when there's a problem. Because now nature, which has got this fine balance going for quite a while, says, I don't know how to deal with those, those numbers anymore. So here is a classic predator-prey population. This one was in color, but this one labels the graph quite nicely. Even in black and white, you can kind of see it says you get a high, uh, high number of prey as the predator population decreases. Oh, not as many wolves, more rabbits. More rabbits, more wolves. There's your equilibrium point right where, where they cross. That, Emily, is where you have exactly, put it away, kiddo. Thank you, dear. Oh, you're looking, okay. You understand my suspicion. Uh, that crossing point, that's where, if you could stop everything right there, probably it would be in good balance, but that's not that healthy. It's good to have fluctuation. This is only looking at two species. This gets really complicated when you look at a whole ecosystem or a community and you say, yeah, I've got eight predators and I've got 30 different prey. Uh, let's try and model that. And this is why, for the most part, Dylan, the best thing humans can usually do with an ecosystem is leave it the heck alone. It's so complicated that even our best attempts to try and fix things almost inevitably wreck things. We have tried occasionally to introduce predators to get rid of a prey that we don't want. A good example is in Australia in the 1920s, they introduced, I think it was 30 bullfrogs to get rid of a particular bug, 30. I think right now they're up to about 30 million of them and it's completely overtaking Australia because that bullfrog has no natural predators in Australia. So it's just multiplying. We've done it here too with plants. Uh, out east in the southern US, we introduced a plant called a kudzu to try and protect cliffs and keep them from eroding along the ocean. Turns out that plant has no natural predators. It's growing like crazy and it's killing off other plants. Hey, we're doing it here off our, east uh, off of our west coast with some of the salmon farms. We've introduced Atlantic salmon because they, they grow better in fish pens. Some of those Atlantic salmon have gotten out and they're breeding or in, in the Pacific population we don't know what's going to happen. Hey, you even remember last year in, uh, was it Bear Creek Park? 
It was a lake in one of the parks here. They had found an Asian carp and they were freaking out because if the Asian carp gets here, it's a fish that can actually crawl on land and it's devastated some ecosystems out in the U.S. southern states. Wasn't that Burnaby Lake? I think it was Burnaby Lake. Yeah, and they basically drained most of they they drained most of the lake to kill it. They were it was better to destroy that ecosystem than let that predator live where it shouldn't be. I think it was a snakehead. You're right. Pardon me. That one I haven't checked up on. We do it all, especially since air travel has become prevalent. We do it unknowingly. Right? We ship stuff from South America coming here, and uh, hey, who knows what's in those crates? So, what are some adaptations? One of my favorites is this one here called Mimicry. This is a form that some prey have adapted to try to look like something else. Camouflage is a basic one. There's a reason why most animals that are prey have brown fur because it blends in quite nicely with brown grass and brown dirt and brown trees. Uh, here's an example. The eastern coral snake is very venomous. The scarlet king snake is non-venomous. But unless you memorize the color pattern, on a coral, it's red, yellow band, black band. On the here, it's black, yellow, black, red. Non-venomous, venomous. I'm not certain. Uh, well, a lot of animals can't tell that apart. Another good example we have out here is monarch butterflies. Have you seen monarch butterflies before? What color are they? Okay, they're the orange and black ones. Uh, they're poisonous. Not killer poisonous, but if a bird eats a monarch, it'll throw up. There's also something called a victory butterfly, which looks almost, or viceroy, I think it's called, which looks almost identical. It's not poisonous, but it has mimicked the monarch so good that you really have to get it with a magnifying glass, and you have to have them side by side to tell them apart. I'm pretty sure birds don't. Page, oh, page 46 has some examples? Oh, there you go. Page 46, if you have your textbook. Ah, my one of my favorites is the walking stick. You've all seen that bug that looks just like a stick. It's incredible. Okay. Justine, you with me? Yes? I promised you guys a very cool video. I don't think I've showed this one to you before. This may be the best ending of any video that I ever show you. Wrong button. Right click, pop. So looking at some pretty cool examples, uh, I said read page 48 together. Can you all turn to page 48? Am I done the lesson? Then no, but I'll be done in about 10 minutes. Okay. Reading along with me, I wrote, it, I wrote, I read this. It says a land, biodiversity and ecosystems. A land area or water body that has a large variety of organisms or great biodiversity is often an indicator of the health of an ecosystem. Generally, more variety means healthier system. Less variety means not so healthy. And in fact, where we have introduced species when we shouldn't have, often you end up with one species, everything else being killed off. <laughs> that might be tin bits. We'll talk. Okay. The problem is each ecosystem, forest, wetland, desert, whatever, has unique biotic and abiotic components that contribute to the availability of food, water, and nutrients. Well, they're unique enough that it's very tough, Nicole, for us to figure out what they are ahead of time. And if I wanted to give you any one message, I would say, hey, as your adults, be leery of mucking around with nature. It's far more sensitive than we realize. And usually the best thing we can do is get out of its way and let it recover. Who knows? Uh, at the very bottom paragraph, as humans continue to use and expand into ecosystems in all parts of the world, biodiversity maintain maintenance becomes more difficult. And so take care of our planet is really the punchline. What's your homework? So I already said part of it was back here. Where was it? Some of you have already done it. Wow, way back here. Page 38. Reading check numbers 1 to 4. Then I said you can try 
page 44 reading check and page 47 reading check. And then I have uh, ecosystems homework sheet. I'm going to give it to you. You can also work on it on Friday. On Friday, I'm also going to give you a take home quiz for chapter one, but I'll give you as much time in class as I can to work on it because I don't want to give you a take home quiz over a four day long weekend. Okay. Let me give you the ecosystems homework handout and then I'll shut up.